the Romans, chapter 13. Brethren, knowing the time, that it is now the hour for us to rise from sleep, for now our salvation is nearer than when we came to believe. The night is past, and the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and impurities, not in, in contention and envy, but put on ye the Lord, put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. And the gospel. Take that according to St. Luke chapter 21. At that time Jesus said to his disciples, There shall be signs in the sun, and in the moon, and in the stars, and upon the earth the stress of nations, by reason of the con con confusion of the roaring of the sea and of the waves, men withering away for fear and expectation of what shall come upon the whole world. For the powers of heaven shall be moved, and then they shall see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with great power and majesty. But when these things begin to come to pass, look up and lift up your heads, because your redemption is at hand. And he spoke to them a similitude. See the fig tree and all the trees, when they, when they, when they now shoot forth their fruit. You know that summer is nigh. So you also, when you shall see these things come to pass, know that the kingdom of God is at hand. And then I say to you, this generation shall not pass away until all things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Those are the words of today's holy gospel. <coughs> this first Sunday of Advent, it's identical to last Sunday, the 24th Sunday after Pentecost, the consideration of the judgment. And our Lord Jesus Christ is coming. Remember, the whole world is a history of preparing for his coming. So we have prepared for 4,000 years for his first coming, 2,000 years for his second coming, and in fact, all the years are preparing for his second coming, that he is going to come in power and majesty to complete the work of judgment. He came and redeemed the world 2,000 years ago and gave every man the possibility of salvation and made, gave the grace to everyone sufficient to be able to go to heaven. But there will be many that shall reject that grace and others shall accept that grace and efficaciously enter the kingdom of heaven and he will come as a judge to see each one. And so the judge is coming and he's, we're getting closer and closer to the time of his coming and we consider that and remember that the Alpha and the Omega is the same. And so today, a few considerations on an element of the, of the judgment of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know that in the very beginning, God said, let us make man according to our own image and likeness. <clears throat> to our own image and likeness. Unto our image, says St. Thomas and St. Augustine, in our image and unto our likeness. So that there's, there's a double side of man. The angels... When they were created, they were created beautiful, and they were created like unto God. But they were created with just a soul and a spiritual side, but they weren't created with passions, they weren't created with a body, they weren't created with the ability to have children, they weren't created with the 11 passions that we have, with the body that we have, with, the, with, all, with so many different things that we have, but while each one in themselves is lower than the angels, it sets us apart from the angels. And we can use our mind and our hearts to guide these lower passions, to guide the body, to increase somehow, to increase and multiply, which angels cannot do, to, to live love in a, in a way that angels cannot live it, to touch, make physical things supernatural in a way that angels cannot do. So while we are lower than the angels, there's something more wonderful and magnificent about us. So that what God did not say of the angels, let us make the angels in our image and likeness. They were made only in his image. But we are made in his image and unto his likeness. We have the power of procreation, which angels do not have. The power to build and make things like churches and to write down ideas and leave them on paper for others to, uh, to be able to see. Even though they by themselves, there are lower things. There's something more beautiful about them than what angels can do. So God made us in his image and unto his likeness. 
There's something sacred about man. And he made the whole history of the world centered upon us, centered upon man. Even when he created the whole world, he said, I made all these things for you. But then we find God comes back. Bishop Sheen mentions it, the first two conversations of God, taken from St. Augustine, I believe. God comes back. Now, he created man in his image and likeness, and he comes back and he speaks to Adam. And the first word that we have him speak is, Adam, where art thou? First words we have God speaking to man, where art thou? Because we, we know that God spoke with Adam before that, God spoke with Eve before that, but we don't know the words that he said, because every day Adam and Eve walked with God. But then one day God came down and Adam was not there. Where art thou? And when he looked looking for him, they found that he was naked. They said, Where do you not come for our daily walk? And Adam said, It's because I am naked. We discover that we are naked. Who told you you are naked? The only way you could know that you were naked is if you ate of the forbidden tree and you disobeyed and ate of the forbidden fruit. I didn't tell you you were naked. How did you know you were naked? And they were ashamed and they were naked. This is what happens when we don't walk with God. The second time, and these two things, we can't go through all the elements, but all sin is summarized in it. The second question we find in sacred scripture, God comes down and speaks again. And this time he says, Cain, where is thy brother? So he said, Adam, where art thou? And the second time he comes and speaks, he says, Cain, where is thy brother? Adam responds by saying, I was naked, we were naked, and we were ashamed. And Cain responds by saying, am I my brother's keeper? You want to know where Abel is? Go ask him. And then God said to Cain, the blood of thy brother Abel has climbed up to heaven. It's climbed to heaven. As we mentioned last night, concerning the Abel, Abel was the first one to die. Remember, there was no death before Abel. He was only 25 years old, maybe, when he died. He should have lived another 900 years. Not like today, another 50 years, another 30 years. He should have lived another 900 years. And now, even though he knew that there was such a thing, he knew that they were condemned to death. No one knew what death looked like for human beings. No one knew what it would feel like. No one knew the effect of it. They only knew that God, one day, to punish them, that one day they would die. And he was 25 years old, plus or minus. And he was taking care of his sheep. And he was worshiping God. He was being pleasing to him. And he was a priest. And he was offering up sacrifice to God, pleasing sacrifice. And he thought he had a whole long, long life ahead of him. But the judgment came. And Cain came and killed him and murdered him. And left his body bleeding in the field. <clears throat> Where art thou? Now we know that that murder is the sin that Cain committed. But what caused that sin? <clears throat> it is the sin that St. Bonaventure calls the true secret sin. The sin that eats away the Catholic faith. The sin that eats away the Catholics. The sin that is most responsible for the damnation of the elderly. The sin that is responsible for the damnation of countless, countless souls which St. Bonaventure calls the true secret sin. It is the sin of envy or jealousy. <clears throat> this sin, he said, we call the secret sins of St. Bonaventure, 1,000 years ago, 800 years ago, we call the secret sin the sin against purity alone because no one sees it. But in fact, it's not a secret sin because the sinner knows very well he has offended God. And he feels, and he often will, 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 will normally repent of this sin or be aware of this sin and go to confession. But the true secret sin is envy. Envy is a sin that is like a worm that works inside the soul and destroys it, and we don't confess it. And it changes our life. And St. Thomas Aquinas tells us the sin of envy is a mortal sin. It kills the soul. And yet the soul in the state of envy... He doesn't even see himself as being in that state. And all kinds of other wicked things happen. What was the cause of the first death on earth? It was a sin of envy, which like the sin of lust, though it is the most common sin, it is not the greatest of sins. And yet it has the greatest effects. And also, when th this is the sin of hell, says St. Augustine, 
For it was envy, that sacred scripture says, that the devil envied. It was envy that made Satan bring sin upon the earth. It was envy that made Satan bring sin upon the earth. Because a, 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 Satan is a creature. And he abandoned God. And he suffered in hell. And the angels are in heaven. And he saw a happy Adam and a happy Eve. He saw the happy human race. He saw creatures of reason and free will that were destined to happiness, and he envied that happiness, and he hated that happiness of a fellow creature because Lucifer is just a creature, and he had sorrow because of the good of Adam and sorrow because of the good of Eve. St. Thomas Aquinas tells us that envy is the sin by which we have sorrow at the good of another. We're sorrowful because another person is good. That is the sin of hell. <clears throat> because in hell, they're already damned. And they will never have good. So they have no hope of goodness themselves. All the suffering they have, they endure and they, uh, they, are, they, they maintain forever. So the only sin they can kind of commit even though they've already committed their sin and they're burning in hell, is a sin of envy that drives them. And there are three stages of envy. Three daughters of envy, three stages of it, says St. Thomas, that come into play. Well, first of all, what is this envy? The envy of a good of another. Now, it is not the envy. Envy is a sin that is very subtle and that many souls have. The book of Job says, envy is a terrible sin that slays the little ones, and those that are faint of heart have it. So who has a sin of envy? It slays the little ones, says sacred scripture. People that are weak, people that are mediocre, Pontius Pilate and the mediocre souls are very familiar with the sin of envy, and the vast majority of souls are mediocre. And envy is the mother of many sins. What does it do? What does it do? It becomes a governing aspect of our lives, and we never confess it. And it takes over our lives, and we don't know. We think when we're dying that we're good people. We think that we're good, and we're going to go to heaven. And we don't repent of our sins. And envy is deep in our blood, and jealousy is deep in our blood. And then we pass to death, to eternal damnation. This happens to countless, countless souls. Now, remember in the very beginning of time, we can count all sins in that very beginning. The first thing was Adam. Adam was walking with God, and one day he didn't walk with God. One day he stopped walking with God. And what does that signify in our lives? It means we're no longer praying to God. We're no longer talking to Him in our daily lives. We're no longer weeping to Him. We're no longer speaking to Him. Like a little child speaks to his mother, like a little child speaks to his father. We speak about the good things, we speak about the bad things, and we refer all things to God. You know that it's interesting that one of the reasons why you may have noticed since the 1990s, the name of God is taken less in vain in movies than it used to be. The reason is because of the Satanists and not because of the Catholics. Because of the Masons and not because of the Christians. Because when you hear the name of God in vain, you are shocked, and you hear the name of God. And so you might think of God. Hence we find in modern movies, there is a major diminishing of the taking of the name of God in vain, and it is done deliberately so that God does not even come up in cursing. So that we don't think of God even when we're cursing. There used to be many, many curses in the olden times. You could curse by God. Catholics used to curse by God. They could curse by the Blessed Virgin Mary. Then they would curse by the saints. Then they could curse by the angels. And even though these things were bad, they believed in God and the angels, the Blessed Virgin Mary and the saints. As time progressed and the belief in the saints disappeared, the cursing of the saints disappeared. The cursing of the angels disappeared. The only thing remains the cursing of God. And now that cursing has disappeared because God is self so we walk away from God, so much so that we can't even, there aren't even direct sins against God like there used to be. Then comes that deep sin that led to the murder of Abel. Uh, now, 
There are more deaths in the 20th century, 21st century, than any other time in human history caused by others, such as abortion, such as the murders that happened in the various wars. And don't forget about the deaths of families by divorce and the deaths of society, which built up on every level. We are fighting against one another in lawsuits, fighting against one another in divorce courts, fighting against one another in business, fighting against one another in all manner of family interaction, so much so that we are in an age now, if I don't have something directly evil to say about anyone, I don't know what to say. We don't have one to have no, and if we have something evil to think about someone, then we have no thoughts. What's the foundation? There's a foundational sin that eats away the soul. It is the sin of envy. So now St. Thomas Aquinas tells us, envy, envy is a sorrow at the good of another. Now it is not every sorrow, for there are four reasons why you can have sorrow at the good of another. One is you might be sorrowful because another person receives a good which can cause you harm. Like you're in World War II and you're getting ready to attack the Germans and you hear the good news. They just received 20 new Panzer tanks. The Germans just got 20 new uh, the um, uh, Tiger tanks, and they got 20 new Panther tanks, and they got 20 new 88 uh, weapon, uh, 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 anti-aircraft guns, and, uh, and so this is good news. But you have sorrow at the good of the other. And why is that? Because those 20 different ta Panther tanks are coming after you. And those 20 Tiger tanks are coming after you. And those 20 88s are going to be shooting at you. And so you are sorrowful that the enemy has received good because they're going to use the good for your harm. This sorrow is not always bad. And this sorrow can also be perfectly compatible with charity. Because as St. Thomas says, when we discover that the enemies of God have become powerful, and when the enemies of God have risen up armies, and the enemies of God have received great wealth, enemies of God have received great benefits so that they can do harm to the friends of God, this causes sorrow. And hence we have sorrow because good has come to another, which good is going to be used for the harm of others. And this sorrow is not envy. Then we can also have the sorrow, the sorrow because the, another person receives a good that we do not have. Somebody has something we don't have, oh, I wish I had that. This sorrow can sometimes be good. Such as, for instance, when you have, the, this is the idea, for instance, of the infomercials at three in the morning. I used to be 475 pounds, and now I only weigh 132 pounds because I exercise and I lose weight and I stop eating 5,000 boxes of donuts. And so you have a sorrow because you still weigh 475 pounds, and you see that he's got a good that you don't have, which is the good of a lot less donuts in the system. And so therefore you have a bit of sorrow, but that sorrow can move you to, you know what, I can do that. I can stop eating 475 donuts a day. I can do exercise. And also, with regard to spiritual things, we see that others are praying, and others are doing penance, and others are following the law of God. I can do that. This is the sorrow that can come because we look at the saints, and we see how they have been pleasing to God, how they have took over, they have taken pain and attacks, and we are sorrowful that we're not like them. And it's a sorrow that moves us to imitate them. This sorrow is not necessarily bad. Each of these sorrows can be turned to bad by looking at the devil turns each of them to bad, but by themselves they're not bad. And then there is a sorrow because unworthy men receive good things. That someone who's unworthy receives good things. And this is actually one of the proofs that God, we know that God is going to reward the just, and he's going to reward the wicked. We know that when souls die, the wicked in this life oftentimes get very wealthy. The wicked in this life oftentimes get great benefits, and they use these things against the others. And therefore we are sorrowful that the unworthy have received good things. And this sorrowful is forbidden, says sacred scripture. It is an evil sorrow, though it is not strictly the sorrow, the sorrow of envy. And though it is called, it's a kind of envy. Be not envious of the goods of wicked men. For one day they shall lose their goods, and they shall get justice. So do not be envious of the goods of wicked men. And this is the third kind of sorrow, that unworthy men receive good. And then the fourth one is what the true sin of envy is, and slowly eats inside of the soul. That we are sorrowful because someone who is equal to us, or close to us, receives a good 
that we wish we had it was a little bit better than us. So for envy is a sin, for instance, says St. Jerome, a king cannot have envy of a slave or a commoner. A commoner cannot envy a king, for envy is something that is for people that are close to one another. We envy our brothers. We envy those of the same type of life of us. We envy those of the similar age or with similar characteristics. Envy, envy is a sin for those that are close and we envy because this person, he's got a good that I wish I had, and I don't have it. Therefore, I hate him, and I have a sorrow for the good that he has. This sorrow eats the soul. It eats the soul. And it has three children. Three children that are the children of this sorrow. The first is tail-bearing. We see that someone has good, and we don't have it. And so, yeah, he got, he got the paycheck, and I didn't get the paycheck. He got the promotion, and I didn't get the promotion. He got the help, I didn't get the help. They, 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 my, my, the father likes him, the husband likes him, somebody likes him more than he likes me, but he doesn't deserve it. And so we speak evil against the person. Sor this sorrow makes us, we are sorrowful because of a good. This sin is a mortal sin in and of itself, says St. Thomas, because it's a direct sin against charity. For charity is the love, is about the good of the neighbor. Charity makes me want good for you, and charity makes me rejoice when good things happen to the neighbor. Envy is a sin directly against charity, by which when the good thing happens, we are angry. When the good thing happens, we are sorrowful, and this sorrow is without reason. It darkens and destroys and weakens the soul. It turns darkness into the soul. And it is, a, it is a sin that Lucifer committed when he looked up to the earth and saw Adam and Eve in peace. It is a sin of the demonic. When they perfect themselves in this sin, whenever they see good, they are filled with hate and they want to destroy it. And it begins, it begins with, I wish I had that. I think I can have that, but he's got it, and it bothers me. It becomes the mother of many sins. St. Bonaventure says it is the mother of impurity. For very often, because we had, I wish I had the house he had, I wish I had the pool that Jones has had, I wish I had the job that he had, I wish I didn't have the work that he had. One of the examples given by St. Augustine, he says, there is envy, for instance, of a man that has that has acquired a good. He's acquired something, and he paid much for it. Then he finds out his neighbor acquired the same thing and paid almost nothing. And he has a sorrow. I paid a thousand bucks for this, and you paid ten bucks and got it at a, at a uh, what do they call it, a yard sale? <laughs> and so you have, a, you have a sorrow, because you, you paid a lot for it, and they paid a little. And the sorrow eats the soul, and you feel unjust. You feel like you've, been, you've, been, you've not been justly treated. This is the sorrow of the workers that is recorded in the sacred scripture when our, when our lords paid a, offered a penny a day for their work. And the, the ones who worked all day got paid a penny. And the ones who worked for one hour got paid a penny. And when the last ones were paid, which were the ones who worked for all day, they also got a penny and they became angry. And they said to the householder, how can you <coughs> give us more? Because we have labored all day with the heats. And what did our Lord say? Is thy eye evil because I am good? Envy creates an evil eye. One of the important benefits of the modern age which helps us develop this sin is the evening news by which we are exposed by an evil eye and the internet and the blogs by which we're exposed to an evil eye. We're looking for evil. We're looking for evil in those associated with us. Look at evil and people in our world and our environment so that we can rejoice in the evil. And if good happens to any of these people, then we have sorrow. Now, pity is destroyed also by, by, um, by envy. For pity is to have sorrow because another person is hurt. Envy is to have sorrow because another person is benefited. And those that have sorrow because another person benefits their pity is destroyed. For if you are sorrowful because another person has good, you will greatly rejoice if evil comes to him. And hence, pity is obliterated. Mercy is obliterated by envy. Note about this sin, and why St. Bonaventure calls it the secret sin, is because it indirectly destroys the soul. 
Why do I not feel pity? I should feel sorry that this person was beaten. I should feel sorry that he lost his job. But I'm happy. But I don't have a good reason to be happy. But I'm happy he lost his job. I'm happy that he's suffering. And this happiness, what does it come from? It comes from the envy. For he who is sorrowful at the good of another must necessarily rejoice when evil comes to him and he is acquiring the spirit of Satan. This is the only rejoicing that exists in hell. In hell they are suffering infinitely and there is no uh, comfort for the damned in hell. But even uh, Annette, in her story of Annette that we mentioned many times, 1937, when she went to hell at the age of 27, we suffer infinitely here. And yet... There is a, and when someone comes to hell because of our own doing, we suffer more, and yet we rejoice. We suffer more, but we are happy that another person is taken away from the clutches of Christ. When the world comes to an end, there shall be no more exercise of envy in the souls of the damned, but they're able to exercise it now upon the just. I want to, I envy, the envy can only be had of those in this life because we want to be able to, we, we want that good to be taken away and it gets deep in the soul. As the years go by, envy fills the soul and it slowly, slowly fills it. When it completely fills the soul, it is generally uncurable. St. Gregory, St. Gregory the Great tells us, Envy itself is the daughter of pride and vainglory. For I, I, I believe that I am a great person and I deserve a pay raise, even though I didn't do anything. I deserve praise. I deserve good that comes to me and another person gets it. Another person gets the pay raise. Another person gets the promotion. Another person gets the, gets the attention. Another person gets pulled out of the pit. And even if I am also pulled out of the pit and receive all the things, I am angry that I'm not getting all of it. I'm angry that another person receives good. And this is developing the spirit of Satan. It has many children. The first child that we mentioned is tail-bearing. I am very sorrowful that another person received good, and so I'm inclined to speak evil against him. And then there is a second thing that happens, and that is we then work to try to take away the good of another. And then two things happen in St. Thomas. We either succeed in stopping him from getting good, because the purpose of tailbearing is, this man, he doesn't deserve the promotion. That guy doesn't deserve the job. This guy is too wicked. That guy is this. This guy is that. This girl is this. And remember when these type of words enter the heart, Annette says in her story, this is when Satan enters the soul, and Satan takes over the soul. Speaking evil words about everyone, particularly your friends, particularly those that are close to you. We're not talking about the evil of saying that you hate Hillary Rodham Clinton and you, and you hate uh, all the, the, the communists. We're talking about hatred and tailbearing of those that are in close proximity, those that we dwell with, and the tailbearing is very careful. We're going to say only a few little things and this and that and the other thing and spread wicked words and, and develop a hatred. That's the third stage. But the second stage is to try to harm the good. Now two things happen. You succeed and the person does not get the promotion. You rejoice in evil. So the first daughter of the envy is tailbearing. And the second is to truly rejoice in evil because they didn't get what they wanted. We stopped them from getting a promotion. We stopped them from getting praised. We stopped them from getting the toy that they wanted as a little child. We stopped them from receiving the gifts. We made them suffer. We made their name mud. And we rejoice that their name is mud. And then there's a second, which is we didn't succeed. And then we become highly depressed. <laughs> Because the good did come. And hence, if, they, if we're able to stop the good, we rejoice in a wicked manner and look for more cause of rejoicing. If the good is not stopped, then we have a great sorrow that leads to hatred. And then hatred comes. And hatred is the terminology, is the end of envy. Envy leads to hate. This hatred is what made Cain murder Abel. 
It, and it, it is the hatred that made Esau go and try to kill Jacob. It is the hatred that made Caiaphas kill our Lord Jesus Christ. What was the sin that led to the death of God made man? It was a sin of envy. It was a sin of jealousy of a priest. Caiaphas was envious. He was high priest. And Jesus Christ is the high priest. He was the head of the church, and Jesus Christ is the founder of that church. And Caiaphas saw the people turning away from himself. And he saw the love being given to Christ that he wanted to receive himself. And he was filled with a deep hatred. And because of his envy, he brought about the death of Jesus Christ. It is the characteristic of the Satanist. When the devil is trying to form souls to become his children and to become truly wicked, envy and jealousy fill the soul. And if the soul begins to look only, the only rejoicing that they get is to cause harm to others, to stop them from receiving goods. Envy becomes a father also of impurities, as we mentioned before, as the St. Bonaventure, because, they're, because in this miserable life, the soul is looking for some kind of release, some kind of release from this misery and dwelling in misery, so it turns to impurity as a temporary release. But then it goes right back to its envy and is more miserable as it seeks for evil and tries to destroy others. This is a problem today, for instance. Souls on the internet are looking for evil at others, and they're looking for evil in their own house. Looking for the evil at others and trying to spread gossip. Whenever they hear any gossip, any wickedness, they're going to spread it. They will not check it out. They won't investigate. They will just spread it like it should be happening today. Today is the first Sunday of Advent. Now I mentioned to you after the Mass in a little discussion that uh, Father, Father, Father Roberts is uh, Father Marshall Roberts is uh, joining us, joined us in Kentucky a couple of days ago, a priest I entered the seminary with 29 years ago, who was in the seminary with myself and Father Huco. We were together as seminarians in, the, in the Winona once upon a time, and uh, 29, 28 years ago. And uh, Father Roberts was ordained a priest in the Society of St. Pius Fifth in 1996. And then he left the Society twice, actually, once as a seminarian to go to the uh, Institute of, of Christ the King. He came back, spent a year in Kansas City, and then was ordained two years late because of that delay. He thought the excommunications of the Archbishop of Lefebvre were ended, ended up being correct, which of course they weren't. But he thought that. And then, and then uh, because they gave him a treatise, uh, Father Yorke uh, de Gordy gave him a treatise, no one knows it before that. He thought they were excommunicated, and later on, and he realized that was wrong, <clears throat> came back to the society, and then in 97, they brought back the same issue again. So you realize that it's in fact he was really excommunicated, or if was really excommunicated, he was really out of the society, I mean out of the church, and you're not a priest of the visible church, Father Roberts. He was saying Mass in Nickelville, New York. So Father Yerd de Gordy and Father uh, Dan Fullerton came to him as a priest had just left the society a week or a few months, a month before, and they said, look, Father Bizek wrote this treatise on the papal uh, mandate that you can only have a bishop by a papal mandate, and they didn't get a papal mandate. You're not a priest of the Catholic Church. You're not a visible priest of the church. So he went home to my brother, Father Tim, in Ridgefield, and he said, I can't say mass. I'm not a priest of the visible church. I have to resolve this problem. And he believed them, and he believed the treaties. And then they said, you don't have to compromise. Join our Society of St. John, and we're not going to compromise. We're going to be we're going to be against modernism, against Vatican II. We're going to have a Latin mass. We're going to bring back tradition. We're going to rebuild Christendom. Eight priests joined. Seven of them said the new mass eventually. One of them got laicized for the sake of money. And they all gave in, except for Father Roberts, the only one not to say the new mass. And the only one not, and they, when they, were, they just gave in. And they, had, they were going to build this big city on a hill, and it all collapsed. And then he was very obedient, obedient to the bishop, the holy bishop Timlin, who's going to be a promoter of tradition. And he did everything he was told to do, except he wouldn't say the new mass, and he wouldn't do the hybrid mass that the Society of St. John wanted to create. So he stayed officially a member, but he went to England instead of staying inside of America with them as they were trying to change the mass and everything. He said, no, I'm not going to be a part of that. Then there came a case, a scandal case, in which two priests, 
of the fraternity of St. John were named as being uh, possibly guilty of, this, of pedophilia. And, they, and they, uh, a case was brought up before them. The case never went to trial. One of the priests said, you must bring this trace to trial because we must be exonerated because we're innocent and we, and we all want to sue the person involved. And the bishop said, no, you can't do it. Forbade him. The other priest had friends and money to, to back him up. He was exonerated because of his personal friends and personal money. He was exonerated. The other priest went through, they said, oh, you're going to be put in the laicization situation. We, we, we're going to see about you being laicized. And in his case has been 15 years, 16 years in Rome, still no conclusion. And then the, 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 the layman started spitting vomit. The priest decided St. John are guilty of homosexual pedophilia. Father Robert's name was thrown in with no actual accusations. No accusations, uh, no actual accusations, ecclesiastical or civil. But a name was thrown in because he was one of the priests. And the mud is thrown around. And many people should today, because today he said his first mass in Kentucky at 12.30 this afternoon. So the, the vomit should begin about that time. It's uh, 4.30 now. So the vomit should begin. It's been three hours. It should have already begun. Be a bit late if it hasn't. And uh, so they say, well, you see, will they, will they check the, the truth of the matter? Will they see the, the case? No, whatever vomit can be put out, put out. And why is this? For many, it is a grave sin of envy that's deep inside the blood. You begin to hate good. You begin to hate truth. And you don't want to see the good spread. And you don't want to see good anywhere. And anywhere you can put vomit, you put it. And with a clean conscience, you say wicked things. What's the most wicked thing you can say against a priest? It's going to be the accusation of homosexual pedophilia. There's nothing worse that can be thrown against a priest to destroy him and his priesthood. And yet, is there going to be any truth to it? Who cares? Of course there's no truth to it, but who cares? Let the vomit be thrown. And there are many sins, and they will not consider themselves to say the mortal sin. And as they attack others, with Bishop Ambrose a couple of years ago, lay out other priests, continue it on and on. Don't ever let it stop. Let the vomit go. Many noble sort of priests, their names are just thrown in the mud without having any evidence against them as well. And yet here there's, there, and there, there is going to be a throwing of vomit and throwing of vomit and throwing of vomit. Not a, but if there is an ecclesiastical trial or if there is a, a public punishment, which is the result of an ecclesiastical trial or public punishment, the result of a civil trial, then that should be notified to the world. So what St. Pius V said, so this is the case of some other priests who have been tried and have been found guilty and have been punished and have the meat of their guilt. These need to be notified to the public as one of the obligations of law, ecclesiastical and civil. But if, if they are truly guilty, if not, forget it. But no one cares about the guilt or the innocence. All that matters is what's beneficial to me and what is harmful to my enemy. And this is very evil before God. And there will be many, many cases of this kind of wickedness. But in any case, it should be happening right now. I'll be shocked if it, if it hasn't. But nonetheless, there is a spreading of evil. It fills the heart. And then they don't go to confession. And if they might forget about it. It's like a serial killer. A serial killer kills hundreds of people. And then someone says, in the small town in Nebraska... Fifteen years ago, you killed my daughter. I don't remember being in that town. Maybe I was. I don't remember. Maybe I did. Maybe I didn't. I can't remember. The family remembers very well because the daughter is dead. The family remembers very well because they can never deal with her again. The serial killer, he can't remember. And we must regard, with regard to serial gossip, there are serial gossipers and serial communicators of wickedness and the serial attitude of trying to destroy whatever good can come to anyone else. And we forget about it. We can't even remember all the names. We can't remember all the places. But the name is this person destroyed. He didn't get the job. Maybe he lost his house because of that. Maybe his wife left him because of that. Maybe he's in the streets because of that. Maybe later on he committed suicide. Maybe he lost the faith. We don't remember and we don't care. And how many souls are affected? This sin reaches into generations. It causes the mafia to have one family hate another family for hundreds of years. 
It causes war between kingdoms to hate each other for hundreds of years and countless deaths and countless mockeries and countless blasphemies, countless attacks, all because of an eating vice inside of the soul. I wanted the promotion. I wanted the position. I don't like it in him. And then it spreads to people you don't even know. It spreads to people you don't care about. It becomes a habit of the soul which makes a, our, us become demonic. It is the sin that is underneath the spirit that our Lord Jesus Christ speaks of in the gospel when he says at the end of the world they will kill you thinking they do a service to God. What sin is underneath all that? It's what St. Bonaventure calls the truly secret sin. It all began with envy. Now what does envy do? It kills charity. Now St. Thomas Aquinas says charity and St. Divine Grace, you can't separate them. You either have charity with St. Divine Grace or you have nothing. You don't have any grace. So the sin that attacks charity directly is a mortal sin. And so it kills the soul. And St. Thomas also points out envy itself as to its genus is a mortal sin, most serious. But the first act of envy, the first motion in that direction, it can be a venial sin. It is when the sin becomes perfected and we are truly sorrowful because of the good that comes to another, leading to a complete rejoicing at the evil that comes to another. And always close together, those you have some association with, some dealing with, not someone far and far and far away, but someone close, and this spirit enters the soul, and then we begin to have a general hatred, a general mockery, a general viciousness, and we begin to look for evil everywhere, and we're comforted only by evil and the sound of evil, and we rejoice whenever evil comes to someone that, that, is, uh, that we don't like, and we, and, and we are sorrowful whenever good comes to another, and we have the habit of pulling down and ripping down others, and this becomes a culture this envy sin, it's so hidden, and it destroys everything. A worm that destroys the whole of, of our life. It killed charity. We are obliged as human beings to love our neighbors. And how many good acts are not done? Now there's a negative side. We, re we are sorrowful because of the good done to another. We rejoice because of their agony. But what about the flip side? What about all the good acts of charity that we did not do? <coughs> what about the good acts to our neighbor we did not do? You know that has always been a hallmark of the traditional Catholic movement. I always. The first thing that anyone notices when they come to our chapels is these are some downright miserable people. That's the first thing everybody notices. And that they're, they're, they're miserable people, traditional Catholics. They're always looking for evil, they're always seeing evil, and they're really good at it. And they're dark. That's the first thing everybody notices. I remember one time in Pulse Falls, Idaho, when I was a newly ordained priest, there was a, there was a young couple that was thinking about the faith, and there were about 1,200 people in the parish at the time. And they said, I'll just stand in the back, maybe someone will talk to me. They went after the hospitalization, because they got ran over, stampeded on the way out of the church. So they stood in the middle, and everybody, when they were, they were holding themselves, guarding themselves, Everybody went through. Then they decided to wait there. Then the people went downstairs, came up, looked at them. What are you doing? And left. So they, they were too nervous to talk. They figured, if we just stand here, somebody will talk to us. Of course not. And so that, what is the spirit that enters? We are supposed to have the spirit of charity. Now on the positive side, it's destroyed. The negative side, we rejoice in evil. And we are sorrowful when good happens. And we think it's legitimate because we know that there are men that are wicked that should have bad things happen to them. When, when Charles Martel died, St. Saint, Saint Boniface was preaching a sermon. And he, stopped, he was preaching on hell or something negative like that. And he stopped in the middle of the sermon he started smiling. And he was filled with great joy in his heart. And he said, my children, rejoice, rejoice, rejoice. For Charles Martel is dead and he burns now in hell. He saw a vision of Charles Martel going to hell. He wasn't depressed. 
And so it is when the souls of the evil are damned, it is a cause of rejoicing for the just. It says in sacred scripture, the just man shall wash his feet in the blood of sinners, and so he shall for all eternity. When they are damned in hell, but on this earth we pray for their conversion, on this earth we pray for their repentance, and if they don't repent, then we eradicate the wicked that they are doing in so far as we can. And then envious souls say, well, maybe Charles Martel is enemy of the church, maybe Rasputin is enemy of the church, maybe the uh, Hillary Rodham Clinton is enemy of the church, but so is Mr. Eh, eh, eh. He is also, he's worse. And he goes to the parish. So that they, be, they have been putting all kinds of people in those categories, and it destroys, destroys, destroys the soul. We do have to condemn evil men from time to time. We have to expose evil sometimes. We have to expose errors sometimes. But these things cannot be inside of our hearts. And what is necessary is that we must communicate that which is true, and we must, we must will that which is good, and desire to put good upon the others. And what does Christ say even about our enemies? Do good to those that hate you. Do good to them. And by doing good to them, you do two things, say the fathers of the church. When I do good to my enemies, it helps them to repent because they realize that we're doing good to them when we should be attacking them. And secondly, if they don't repent, it heaps coals of fire on their head. They will burn more in hell. So if you want to get vengeance, real vengeance on your enemy, do good to him. And if he repents, then he is no longer your enemy. If he does not repent, he shall burn more in hell because of it, and forever. And therefore, it's the right thing to do good to the enemy. And so the sin of envy gets deep in the soul. It destroys. It's one of the seven capital sins, called the capital sins because it is related to the other sins, and it leaves the other sins. St. Augustine says, and St. Thomas says, the seven capital sins, pride, covetousness, lust, envy, anger, gluttony, and sloth, they are very close to one another. Each of them is similar to the other, and sometimes it's not obvious. Each of them is similar to the other, they're very close to one another, and they become the heads of the other sins, hence they are called capital. And one that we don't think of much is that sin of envy, and we don't take it seriously Realize this, St. Thomas, it kills charity. Charity is the life of God in my soul. The sin that kills charity and makes it die inside of me kills everything. We find, for instance, very often the murderers are sometimes, the thieves are sometimes generous. Like the thief that stole $1,000 from a poor couple and the lady woke up in the middle of the night and said, I need $400 for a medical bill for my son. And so he gave back $400 and left the $600. He kept the four, and he was generous. He stole the 600, left the 400. And then when he got caught and thrown in prison, the wife said, he gave me $400. If he didn't give me the $400, I wouldn't be able to take care of my kid. They tried to explain to her that you had $1,000. He took 600, but he gave me 400. He gave me 400, so don't arrest him. And the <coughs> fact is, that we, but when it comes to the sin of envy, it destroys even that kind of charity of the thief the charity of the prostitute, the charity of the liar. Envy kills the heart. It kills it. And it becomes the mother of talebearing, the mother of rejoicing in all evil that is heard, the mother of, of, of being sorrowful in all good that comes to others, and the mother of hatred, which eventually spreads through the entirety of the soul and makes us like unto Satan, from them, and yet without any sense of guilt, without any sense of remorse. So that the spirit of hell fills the soul. And it is a sin, especially of the little ones, the sacred scripture in the book of Job. It's a sin of the little ones, those that are faint of heart, those that are weak, those that are mediocre. And it helps them never to return to God. Let's fight very strongly against that sin and live by charity. And, and by the truth. And Jose, God bless you all. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.